Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Ancient Warfare Answers with me, Murray. You can, of course, ask us a question whenever you like, however you like. Um, if you want to, you can go back and look at the last couple for the address, uh, physical address to send it to. Um, I've set up a PO box. Exciting. Uh, now, this question is, again, one of these uh, people on YouTube who uh, thought that they'd been abandoned completely, and I apologize that we aren't able to reply to every question that's asked uh, or indeed to reply to the comments. Um, that's a full-time job. And also, you know, thinking they're being an orphan and abandoned. We're not abandoning you. We, we, we're just busy and can't get around to everything. And anyway, this uh, viewer on JSOF, uh, JSOF2675, thank you, JSOF, asked a question, what account do you find most convincing as supported with modern evidence of the Battle of the Milvian Bridge? Now, oh, what a lovely question. You can, of course, ask us a question. Um go to the website, send us an email, uh, you can back us on Patreon, and we will attempt to answer it. So the Battle of Milvian Bridge, uh, or the Ponte Milvio in, in Italy, just north of Rome, uh, is fought on October the 28th in 312 AD, and it is fought between Constantine, or who will become Constantine, uh, Flavius Valerius Constantius, uh, and the other emperor, Maxentius. Uh, this is part of the fallout of the system put in place by Diocletian. So when Diocletian becomes emperor, he decides that he's going to split the empire in half uh, and that each half of the empire will have a Caesar and each half of the empire will have an Augustus. And so there's four. Uh, what the idea is, and this is what Diocletian does, is he will retire and his fellow emperor Augustus will retire and their Caesars will take over as Augustus's and they will then appoint new Caesars. Beautiful system, falls apart within only a couple of years. Uh, because when Constantius is, sorry, when Constantine's father, Constantius or Constantius I, dies in 306, his army immediately declares Constantine emperor rather than whoever the Caesar was. So essentially it leads to renewed civil wars and we basically then get a whole period of civil wars right through until the 320s uh for control over the western roman empire and then the eastern roman empire so this is a battle between constantine marching into italy against maxentius who marches north from rome now this is a a period where we don't have ammianus marcellinus surviving for this battle so we rely on um some peculiar sources for it. Uh, the first of those is uh, a couple of panegyrics that are written later talking about the battle, and then mainly the historian Zosimus. Um, so Zosimus gives us numbers, the panegyric gives us different numbers. So working out which one we trust is tricky. So for instance, uh, the Constantine's army, we're told, has 35,100 infantry. That's according to the panegyric. Zosimus, however, gives us 90,000. Cavalry, we're told by Zosimus that there's 8,000, and in the panegyric, 4,900. So, you know, we've got between 40 and 90, so twice as many in Zosimus as in the panegyric. Zosimus generally tends to get disregarded as being untrustworthy, mainly because he relied on a historian um, as his major source named Eunapius, uh, and Eunapius is regarded as unreliable. But they tend not to be as unreliable as people say. So at the same time, Maxentius's army, the anonymous panegyric says it's 100,000 men, whereas uh, Azosimus has 170,000 men. So both essentially will have Constantine outnumbered two to one. Again, in cavalry, it's two to one. So in Zosimus, it's 18,000 cavalry as opposed to Constantine's eight. And in the panegyric, it's 9,500. It's made to look like Constantine is the underdog. And one of the reasons for that, and this is also one of the reasons why the sources are fascinating, because, of course, probably the most famous thing known about the Battle of the Milvian Bridge is the idea that Christian soldiers in Constantine's army tell him that they will provide him with the victory and he just needs to look for the sign. So uh, that's probably the most famous uh, aspect of that. Now, interestingly, that comes back much, much later, but it is it is contemporary. So Lactantius, for instance, and Eusebius, who are both contemporaries, they're writing only a couple of years after the battle, they give us this role of Christians and the Christian God in Constantine's victory. Now, 
it's fascinating because, of course, Constantine tolerates Christianity after this point. He tolerates all religions after this point, but he doesn't become a Christian, which is Tim, generally what people say happened. He gets baptized on his deathbed in 337. Uh, there's a complicating thing about Sol Invictus that he puts out there as well. So it's not necessarily that he's become a Christian. It's that Christians are no longer being persecuted under Constantine. Um, so the idea that Christian soldiers would claim any kind of responsibility in any wide way in the immediate aftermath of the battle is very unlikely. But we do have Christian soldiers, Christian writers, telling us about this uh, in what probably was a very small community. Uh, and of course, when Christianity is successful after uh, Constantine's reign, those writers, Eusebius and Lactantius and others, get promulgated and, and disseminated far wider. The idea, of course, is that um, the story is that there's a heavenly sign, that he had a dream, uh, and he, you know, was interpreted as the Kiro symbol, which becomes the, the symbol of the 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 Roman sim, the Roman battle standard later, the Labarum. And so this is this is the account that most people know. So the idea, of course, is that Constantine uh, comes down towards Rome, Maxentius marches north, and they meet. And from there it's a very vague what actually goes on. Now, for my thinking, and this is a fascinating aspect of warfare, ancient warfare in general, there are battles that are won and there are battles that are lost. And often our sources tell us about a victor, but they don't necessarily tell us that the victor won the battle. Very often it can be that the, the defeated lost the battle and so, therefore, by default, the victor won, rather than the victory being a, a factor of anything that the actual victor did. Now, there are other battles, absolutely, where the victor won. They took action and decisively won a battle. But the Battle of Milvian Bridge, for me, is one of these battles where, yes, Constantine wins the battle, but not because he wins it, because Maxentius loses it. Now, this is probably quite controversial and not really an opinion I've seen put out there. Maxentius has this bizarre plan that he sabotages the bridge, the Milvian Bridge. There's a one version of the events that he builds another pontoon bridge, but it's got this very, very complex way that the bridge is in fact going to be uh, dismantled. And he's essentially, what I think he's trying to do in the battle is he's going to go out and engage Constantine north of the battle, north of the, the bridge, uh, across the river Tiber, and then he is going to withdraw and pull Constantine following him onto the bridge, which he's then going to collapse through this complicated mechanism he's devised and therefore kill Constantine, specifically Constantine. So very much a matter of the revolt will, which of course Maxentius regards Constantine as the usurper, or the rival at least. So killing Constantine means his his quest to become emperor is at an end. And now, of course, as things turned out, Maxentius dies, uh, and indeed his his rule is at an end. And that's because his complicated device fails. So we'll get to that in a minute. So we've got these speeches that tell us, and of course, these are panegyrics to Constantine, so they're looking to make Constantine uh, and they're written after Constantine's victory. Zosimus less so. So I, I would trust Zosimus not necessarily on the numbers, but certainly in terms of the, the general uh, tenor of the battle. So we've got this idea that the bridge seems to have been a central part of Maxentius' battle plan, um, but it's missing in most of the Christian accounts. So what you find in the Christian accounts is they, they criticise Maxentius because he goes north of the bridge over the river and essentially cuts off his own escape. But I think the cutting off of his escape is what happens. It's not what he planned to happen. Uh, and again, you can look at multiple battles in the ancient world where the the perfectly sound battle plan fails. Battle of Cannae, the Roman legions push back the the Gallic and Spanish mercenaries of Hannibal. That's that's going to exactly to plan, and you know pushing through them and breaking them. That's you are doing exactly what uh, ancient battle tells you you should do. The fact that Hannibal comes up with a, a an elastic plan to absorb that advance and then swing around the flanks with his African 
veterans and then the cavalry return to complete the envelopment, that's not something that the Roman commanders at Cannae envisage happening. So again, I think what happens at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge is Maxentius has this complex bridge sabotage plan. So he goes across the bridge and then we get told in several sources that they, the soldiers see the bridge being dismantled. Is it being dismantled or is it being messed with? To fit this plan, uh, and of course you have this complicated idea of this pontoon bridge as well, which is which is tricky in itself. So I think that the idea is that he goes out past the bridge, he draws up his troops. We're told as soon as Constantine charges, Maxentius's army breaks and flees back towards the bridge. But this is the same bridge that apparently has already been dismantled. So for me, the withdrawing immediately is a preconceived plan. The dismantling of the bridge is not a collapsing or dismantling of the bridge. It's designed that they will get back across the bridge and trap Constantine on it. And that's not what happens in the battle. And that idea, again, Lactantius tells us that the like burning your ships when you land on a foreign shore, you're forced to fight. That's the picture that Lactantius paints, that the dismantling of the bridge north of, you know, on the north bank of the Tiber is telling his troops they have to fight. And again, those those sources give us that Mag- Maxentius outnumbers Constantine two to one. So, you know, if if it's 100,000 versus 40,000 or if it's 170,000 versus 90,000, Maxentius has the numerical advantage. But I don't think that that's what happens at all. I think that these later sources have rewritten the history, not only the the role of Christian soldiers in the battle, but actually the battle itself. And they've turned it into a Constantinian victory and into a God sent, a Christian God sent victory. And that's the version that's come down to us. But I think that it's actually a a ruse gone wrong on the half of Maxentius. So Constantine didn't win the battle. Maxentius lost it. Uh, Now, again, that's probably controversial, uh, but certainly when you look at the evidence, for me, that seems to be what's happening. Uh, I think that the immediate flight, the expecting Constantine to lead his troops, which is what he's done thus far, Constantine leading his cavalry is something that Maxentius can expect, and therefore allowing Constantine to pursue the fleeing Maxentian troops onto the bridge, onto the, the, the Milvian bridge, and then collapse it when he's in the middle of it is a sound plan, overly complicated, and as it turns out, so overly complicated that it fails. And we don't know whether it fails through a mechanical error or whether it fails because the men on the bridge got spooked and, you know, pulled the rope too soon and therefore the bridge collapsed too early. Possibly that 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 sort of smacks of verisimilitude. I think that's what's that's what's happening. Um, you know, the the uh, again we get Zosimus who gives us the detail that Constantine sent his horse to attack the opposing cavalry who flee immediately. I think that's part of the plan. Nazarenus tells us that Constantine was the first to fall on the enemy, implying he's leading the cavalry charge. And again, I think that plays into Maxentius' plan. And again, in the terms of the, the panegyric, what we have is Nazarenus telling us that Constantine personally and alone breaks into the enemy ranks and starts slaying Maxentian troops. So, you know, the idea that it's a one sided battle and that uh, Constantine simply wins. I think is ignoring the fact that Maxentius had a plan in the battle. As any battle, both sides have a plan as to what is meant to happen. And very often in the, the the sources and in modern historians, we don't tend to look at both plans. We tend to look at one only. Uh, and as I say, the a lot of the historical accounts tell us about someone winning a battle, not necessarily someone losing a battle, but they also can get those things around the wrong way because we, you know, the, the winners write history. And in this case with Constantine, absolutely the winners write history. And, and and even in terms of Christian writers writing the version of events, not just Constantine. And so, yes, that's my that's my hot take on the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. I think that Maxentius had a a sound but overly complicated plan to win. And unfortunately it comes completely unstuck. Zosimus tells us that the timbers of the modified bridge can't hold the weight of the retreating cavalry and they give way as Maxentius and his bodyguard cross it rather than allowing Maxentius and his bodyguard across and then doing the collapsing when Constantine is on it. 
So, you know, that's the, that's the self. The other versions of events that have the second bridge of boats um, do do a similar thing, um, falling into the water and all of the troops being cut down on the, the river bank. So I think that that collapsing of the bridge does happen early. The plan to retreat over the bridge, whether it be the Milvian Bridge or the Pontoon Bridge or both, uh, gets thrown into disarray and they get trapped on the riverbank and slaughtered. Uh, but again, I think that it's much less a Constantinian victory than it is a Maxentian defeat. But I do think that Constantine absolutely takes advantage of the fact that uh, Maxentius' stratagem fails. And uh, you know we're told again by Nazarenus that there's an un- unbroken line of slaughter um, as the Tiber fills with the bodies of the in- enemy. And Maxentius, of course, is shamed by the fact that he doesn't die in combat he dies because he drowns you know um and again this is not playing into the idea that him fleeing over the bridge was part of his plan to fight another day and trap constantine it's the sort of you know ah well of course he deserves to be um killed because he's you know dies shamefully so that's that's my take on the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. So thank you, GC. Sorry, JSOF. No, GC was the last question. Getting confused. Anyway, um, look forward to having another Ancient Warfare Answer session with you sometime very soon. Thanks very much. Bye.